Oh no, it's the RR2038, my car to work knife. Have we not heard enough about this knife already? I mean, everyone is talking about it. Everyone is talking about how great it is. Uh, you see it on all the uh, different news groups. You see it on YouTube. You see it in Facebook. Everywhere, people just seem to love this knife. So what's the point of me doing another video on this knife? Well, for one thing, I actually do know a thing or two about Rough Riders, and I've been collecting them for a long time. So I know what the quality is like and everything else. And I thought maybe, just maybe, people would like to know why I picked up this particular knife. Now, first of all, it has nothing to do with the hype about the knife because, quite frankly, the way people have been talking about it, I figured I was going to be disappointed with it as soon as I picked it up because there has been so many people who have been head over heels in love with this knife that there's no way it can live up to the hype. And I will tell you right now, in my opinion, it does not live up to the hype. But that does not mean it's not a terrific knife. It just means that a lot of people have been talking about this knife to extremes and uh, perhaps they're just not familiar with Rough Riders enough or something of that nature. So why did I pick it up? Well, my first attraction to the knife is the overall shape of it. If you notice, it's a swayback knife. I like swayback knives, but more importantly, this is a swayback knife that has a Warncliffe blade and there is a knife out by case that is actually a Tony Bowes swayback knife and this knife is basically the big brother to it. Uh, it's got the Warncliffe blade, it's got the swayback handle, the only difference is, is it's beefier, stockier and um, well a whole lot less expensive than the Tony Bowes swayback by case. Uh, steel wise you got 440A versus 420 high carbon in, uh, in your case knife. So steel-wise, it's about the same. Um, brass liners, uh, nickel silver bolsters, or it might be stainless steel, I can't remember. I'll have to put that in the, uh, in the um, description here. Um, and you've got the uh, lanyard tube or lanyard hole going on here. And then the paper micarta handles instead of bone. But basically, it's like the uh, big, beefy, stocky brother of a Tony Bowes uh, swayback uh, Warncliffe knife, and that's one of the one of the things that got me interested in the knife is that I can't afford the Tony Bowes swayback, but this is a close cousin to it. Let's put it that way. And second of all, like I mentioned, I like swaybacks. Um, yeah, you know, and that's typical that you find in a hawkbill, some kind of swayback frame on a hawkbill knife. But instead of having the oversized hawkbill blade like you have on this, uh, I think this one is by uh, this one is by Hibbard, Spencer, and Bartlett. You have a much uh, cleaner um, uh, Warncliffe blade, so it isn't as far up, and you still have that straight edge like you would have on like a sheep foot blade. But you got the nice point going on to it, so it's a little more functional than what you find in a swayback with a hop bill or like a, a sheep foot blade on there. You have a more versatile blade in a swayback frame, and um, fits good in the hand. So there's another pos uh, positive about the knife. And as for the uh, black handle, it reminds me of the uh, phenolic handles you find on your like TL29 electrician knives, which is where the work portion comes into this. This is not your gentleman's knife, even though it looks very elegant. This is really a work knife, so it's designed to actually do some work, despite uh, its fit and finish and such. And that was the uh, other big draw for me. Um, as for the actual fit and finish on this knife, well, uh, there's a couple issues on this one, this particular one. One of them is right here. This looks like it's been uh, sanded down a little farther. You, it looks it, but it feels about the same on both sides. Um, a lot of people are complaining about the blade not being centered, and that's because a lot of people who are buying this knife 
are people who are not at all familiar with traditional pattern knives. This is very popular among um, the modern folder crowd uh, who are grabbing their first uh, traditional pattern slip joint and they're expecting that blade to be perfectly centered, right like that. Uh, that's not what happens with a lot of traditional pattern knives. Um, these, uh, if you notice, there's no screw holding this in place. You don't have that little uh, torque wrench to tighten up the blade or loosen up the blade. It is pinned in place. They center it when they get it all set, then they pin it in place, and they polish it down. And sometime in that processing, the blade might move a little bit, so it is no longer perfectly centered as it was when they first started tapping it in place. Uh, that's a fact about uh, traditional pattern knives. If that's a real issue with you, you're probably going to want to steer clear of traditional pattern knives because that's just one of the things. It's not a big deal uh, to folks in the traditional pattern world, especially when you're talking about a knife that costs 13 bucks. What's a bigger deal in the traditional pattern world are things like walk and talk, and by that they're talking about this. Notice how the blade has a half stop. It comes to a very sudden stop in the middle, and then you have to open it the rest of the way up. And then, this is where centering comes in mind. Is that blade straight there? And yes it is. Is it tight? Yes it is. Can you cut with it? Yes you can. That's the functionality of a traditional pattern knife, and that's what uh, people who collect traditional pattern knives are looking for. Not how straight it is in the frame here, but how straight it is there and how well you can cut with it, and if there's any blade wobble. And then, how well it closes. Does it have a good solid closing? Uh, in this case, it's using what's known as a half stop, so there's the, the it stops right there when you're closing it. Uh, it's, some people think of it as a safety feature. I look at it as just one of the features. And then as you push down, you got a good snap when it closes. When you open it, you hear the snap when it's closing, uh, opening all the way up. You got a nice swedge going on here on both sides of the blade. That's another nice little feature. Um, and it is usually a sign of a more quality knife when you see such things. So the finish of the knife is actually quite good despite a few rough spots on it. If you notice with the brass liners and the uh, handles, it's nice and clean. It uh, matches up really well. Uh, smooth coming across all of the features here where the bolster meets into the handle. It's smooth. It's smooth along the back spring and the uh, liners and the handles and um, it's smooth around the edges here. You can feel this is just a little proud around the liner for the uh, lanyard hole, but the fact that there is a lan uh, liner in the lanyard hole, or what they call a lanyard tube now, is also a sign of something that is a, of a higher quality knife. Plenty of knives do not have that tube in there. So all in all, the knife is pretty well made for a traditional pattern knife. Is the blade perfectly centered? No, but that's not a real complaint on traditional pattern knives, even though there are people out there now who are making a big stink of it. Not really the case. So what was the last reason why I decided to pick this knife up? I'm almost embarrassed to say, but there's the knife. You see what it is. Um, I was hesitant to pick it up at first, uh, mainly because uh, while I like picking up different styles of knives and everything, uh, the knife needs something to go in my collection, and black micarta is not part of the collection. If, if this knife had come out originally in tortoise shell, like this, I would have probably picked it up right away. Also, if it was in white smooth bone, I would have picked it up in a heartbeat, no problem at all. Um, another thing is if it was in something like this, which is the uh, Stonework series, if this would have been a new knife in the Stonework series, I would have paid double what the uh, work knife cost uh, as it is right now, you know, the 13 bucks or so that you pay for it. But because it was not in something I normally collect, I actually passed on it the uh, first time around. And then uh, I started hearing everyone talk about it and how great it was and everything else. Uh, Smoky Mountain Knife Works sold out of it. They ordered a second run of it. 
and that's when I decided I need to get one. It basically came down to FOMO, fear of missing out. So I picked up this knife simply because everyone else was picking it up. Uh, and part of the reasoning behind that is because this knife is extremely popular, but it, you're not going to be seeing it like this from uh, Smoky Mountain Knife Works for very long. So uh, typically what they end up doing is they make a run of it. If it's really popular, they do a second run of it. And uh, if it's really, really popular, uh, well, they made a second run of it. So you should have got it then because uh, the chances of them making a, a third run of a knife like this become slimmer and slimmer. Because you got to remember, they're making these knives to sell the first time around. And the last thing they need is overstock because then what happens is instead of having to sell this knife for twelve ninety nine or or something like that, they end up putting it in the discount bins and they're they're throwing it out there for five bucks and such, and that does a lot to hurt the reputation of the knife. So they make enough uh, to sell and then it goes off to the secondary market. So chances are um, this is going to be one of those knives that you end up finding on the secondary mark and it's and it's going to cost a lot more than what you would have paid if you would have picked it up at Smoky Mountain Knife Works. Uh, I'm assuming it's going to sell out again and when it sells out again um, you probably will not see it again in black paper micarta. That doesn't mean the pattern will go away. I have a feeling you'll still be able to see these Warncliffe Swaybacks, you know their Warncliffe Swayback uh, work knife. But chances are it's going to appear in a different kind of handle material. And that's where I'm hoping that perhaps tortoise shell or white smooth bone might come out in a future iteration of this knife. And uh, that's what I'm hoping for. That's what I'm looking for. Um, but as it is, there's also the chance that this knife uh, may never come back again at all. In which case I've at least got it in the uh, black paper micarta and it is a pretty cool knife um, I think uh, like I mentioned a lot of the people who have reviewed it have set a very high mark for the knife uh, higher than what a lot of people are expecting they're expecting it to be able to walk on water but to be honest with you it's probably going to get its ankles wet if it tries to walk on water it's a really good knife. It's a quality knife. It's uh, right up there with any other Rough Rider knife that you're going to buy, especially among the uh, newer ones. It's got all the features that you expect in a uh, Rough Rider knife. You've got the uh, excellent, very strong half stop. A lot of people will probably complain about the pull on this blade because it's a little rough. It's not the easiest pull you're going to find on a knife. And like I said, we're already hearing people complain about the centering on the blade. Like I mentioned, though, <laughs> that's probably coming from people who collect modern knives or, or are expecting this thing to be the same quality as something you're going to get out of Great Eastern Cutlery. If this was being put out by Great Eastern Cutlery, you're looking at $130 as opposed to $13. So you got to move over some decimal points if you're expecting that blade to be perfectly centered. And quite frankly, uh, I've seen the centering on Great Eastern knives and I've seen the centering on case knives. And uh, most of the time, the centering on a Rough Rider will rival those other knives. So all in all, really well-made knife, really top quality. Um, it's not a 10 out of 10 or 100 out of 100. You're looking at something that's more like an 8.5 or a 9 out of 10 in my book. It's a very solid, well-made knife, and it will definitely cut. And that's really what you're looking at. And like they said, it's a work knife. And for a work knife, if you're buying this to use and cut things up, you're going to be able to peel your uh, apple and you're going to be able to whittle with it and you're going to be able to do most everyday tasks with it. But it is 440A, so you also are going to need to sharpen it once in a while. There's my take on the uh, RR2038 uh, work knife. Hope uh, that clears up a few thoughts about it and uh, hopefully at least now you 
got to take from somebody who is very familiar with Rough Rider knives and actually knows a thing or two about traditional pattern knives. Okay, here are all the specs as uh, according to the Smoky Mountain Knife Works uh, website. They give the blade length at 3.125 inches. That's about three and an eighth of an inch, uh, which comes in at 80 millimeters or thereabouts. And then the closed length is 3.87 inches, which is about three and seven eighths of an inch or 98 millimeters. And then they give the overall length at uh, 6.87 inches, which is about six and seven eighths of an inch or 174 millimeters. You can read the rest of this by just pausing. Oh, and as for the California Prop 65 warning, that basically comes down to the fact that the blade is uh, 440A stainless steel. And because of that, it has a little bit of chromium in the steel. And because of that, as far as they're concerned, it can cause cancer or reproductive harm. So if you want to suck all the chromium out of the blade and you live in California, you might get cancer. What the heck, a couple close-up photos. Here's the uh, lanyard tube or lanyard hole, whatever you want to call it. And here's a close-up of the new Rough Rider tank stamp along with the triple-ringed brushed stainless steel bolster. Backside of the tank stamp showing the pattern number RR2038 and the country of origin, China. And here you see a close-up of the paper micarta handles and the brass liner and the uh, stainless steel back spring and you can see the slight gap between the left brass liner and the uh, back spring. Another view of that very slight gap you cannot feel it when you rub your finger across it and you can also see that very smooth brass pin in there and that really nice swedge on the front of the blade, which allows for a much sharper point on that Warncliffe blade. And finally, the glamour shot of the RR203 Black Micarta Work Knife. Hope you enjoyed it. Talk to you again soon. Thank you so much for joining us. I hope you enjoyed this uh, episode of Knife Chats, and if you did, please like and share it with your friends. Comments are always welcome. Don't forget to subscribe and ring that notification bell so you'll know when the next episode of Knife Chats is up online. Thanks again. Hope to see you soon.